Our final panel this morning is called The Things They Left Behind, The Legacies of the Vietnam War. And our moderator today is Tim Reeser, who is a senior foreign policy aide to Senator Peter Welch, a role he served for nearly 35 years for Senator Patrick Leahy. Um, Tim Reeser is one of the most interesting people you could ever meet. Uh, I will not go into his, his long and distinguished career in public service and in the Senate. Uh, however, in 2015, he was listed as number 22 of the Politico 50, a guide to the thinkers, doers, and visionaries transforming American politics. Among the many things he has accomplished is that he was influential in opening US policy toward Cuba and playing a significant role in getting USAID contractor Alan Gross re released from prison in Cuba. Uh, since my students, most of them uh, from my class aren't here right now, I would encourage all of you to Google Tim Reeser Oppenheimer uh, for an amazing story of the rehabilitation of Oppenheimer's uh, reputation. Uh, and the reason I say that I'm glad my students aren't here because they would go to their computers immediately and Google it, <laughs> and you all have the patience to wait. So, uh, but please do so afterwards, and I, I am uh, delighted to have Tim Reeser as the moderator for our next panel. Tim. That was an amazing experience. And Senator Leahy, who knew my father, my father worked at the Manhattan Project um, during the Second World War. And he was, he was only uh, 22 years old when he joined the Army. And he ended up being sent to Los Alamos. And that's a whole other story, but one that I would love to, at some point, talk about. But today, um, you know, first of all, I, I just wanted to comment on something. That, it was either David or Greg who said this, that many of us, I was, I was, I was 17 in 1969, really at almost the height of the Vietnam War, and I became draftable at, in 1970. Fortunately for me, I got a high lottery number. Uh, otherwise, I would have had to make one of those decisions that Greg talked about. I would have had to either go to prison, leave the country, join the army, whatever. I wasn't going to do that, but I, I was spared that dilemma. Um, but so I ended up being among those who traveled to Washington as a high school student uh, to take part in protests against the war. And because I knew that the war was wrong, but as I think David may have said, you know, we really didn't actually know very much more than that, uh, those of us who were in high school. Uh, and so ever since then, I've been uh, learning, and this is no exception um, to hear from people uh, like those who fought in Vietnam and others who protested against the war. Um, it's been, you know, a great opportunity for me as I think hopefully for everyone else here. Um, I'm just going to say a few words. Um, we've obviously listened to three of the Vermonters. Actually, there were 7,332 7, Vermonters who served in Vietnam. Uh, 138 of them died there. Uh, we've also heard uh, what the war years were like for university students who opposed the war and who were leaders in the movement that convinced Lyndon Johnson uh, not to run for re-election. Uh, but David reminded us that the war went on for another five years for the United States and another 21,000 Americans died after Johnson left office and countless Vietnamese. For many of the Vietnamese and Americans, though, who served in Vietnam, and we've heard a bit about this, the war, and, and for their families, the war never really ended. And in 1975, at the end of the war, officially, more than 2,000 Americans and hundreds of thousands of Vietnamese were missing in action. And the country was littered with landmines, unexploded bombs, landmines, and f at former U.S. air bases uh, where millions of gallons of Agent Orange and other defoliants had been stored and loaded onto aircraft, they were badly contaminated with dioxin. 
the war left countless former soldiers and civilians severely disabled from war injuries, and the severe physical and cognitive damage caused by Agent Orange that has been passed down from one generation to the next. And Senator Leahy and I have met some of the families who are coping with this problem today. It's these legacies of the war that Senator Leahy worked to address over the last 35 years. And by doing so, gradually opened the door to a new era, era of cooperation, as the ambassador described, between the United States and Vietnam. As Senator Leahy has often said, the war was a catastrophe for both countries. I think we've gotten a reminder of that here. But what the United States has done to heal the wounds of the war is also part of the shared history of the United States and Vietnam that not many Americans know about. Hundreds of millions of dollars provided by Congress, thanks to him, for programs administered by the US Agency for International Development, the Department of Defense, represented here by Chuck, uh, who served for many years, uh, and the Department of State together with their Vietnamese counterparts, have made this possible. This last panel, therefore, is not about what happened before 1975. It, it's comprised of people who have really each devoted their lives to, to playing a role in implementing the programs I've just mentioned to address the worst legacies of the war and which Senator Leahy has also <laughs> devoted the last 30 years to doing. I'm going to introduce each of them, and then uh, I think you'll find that I don't have to ask a lot of questions. They're quite good at speaking for themselves. <laughs> Susan Hammond, a Vermonter, is the daughter of a US veteran. She became interested in post-war Southeast Asia after traveling to Vietnam and Cambodia in 1991. In 1996, after earning her master's degree in international education from NYU, she returned to Vietnam to study Vietnamese. She became involved in mutual understanding between the people of the United States and Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. We talk about the Vietnam War, but I think many of us know that it was more than that. And addressing the long-term impacts of war while working as a deputy director of the Fund for Reconciliation and Development from 1996 to 2007. During that time, among other places, she lived in Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos. In 2007, Susan returned to Vermont and founded the War Legacies Project to continue addressing the long-term health and environmental impacts of the war, including the impact of Agent Orange on Vietnam and Laos. In 2019, she received the Vietnam Order of Friendship Medal for her more than two decades of work in Vietnam. A Vermonter we can certainly be proud of. Chuck Casey, recently retired from the Marine Corps after a 25-year career spanning enlisted and officer assignments across aircraft maintenance and international affairs, mostly concentrated on the Indo-Pacific region. From 2017 to 2020, he served as the Marine Attaché at the U.S. Embassy in Hanoi, where he focused on political military issues and collaborating with Vietnam on humanitarian and legacy of war challenges. From 2020 to 2022, he served as the Deputy Commander of the Defense POW MIA Accounting Agencies Detachment 2 in Hanoi, where he focused on accounting for Americans still missing in action from the war. Before retiring, he served at headquarters Marine Corps focused on Indo-Pacific ally and partner relations, the son of a Marine who served two combat tours in Vietnam. Chuck is committed to humanitarian and legacy of war cooperation and advancing reconciliation with Vietnam. Sarah, okay, you, say, you pronounce your name. <laughs> 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 Served 
as CEO of Legacies of War and chair of the US campaign to ban landmines and cluster munitions. <clears throat> as an expert in mine action, Sarah has been featured in the Washington Post, USA Today, NBC, and other publications. Sarah and her team received the inaugural Humanitarian War Award in 2022 from the government of Laos for their efforts in advocating for US funds for bomb clearance, victims assistance, and explosive ordnance risk education. And she will be able to talk about what happened in Laos during the war in Vietnam that most Americans know almost nothing about. Andrew Wells Dong. Andrew leads the Vietnam War Legacies and Reconciliation Initiative at the US Institute of Peace in Washington. The initiative was launched in 2021 with congressional encouragement and support, in part to continue the efforts of Senator Leahy and others to address both physical and interpersonal legacies of the Vietnam War. He lived in Vietnam for a total of 20 years, starting in 1997, including work with Catholic Relief Services and Oxfam and research and writing on civil society and politics in Southeast Asia. Andrew speaks fluent Vietnamese. I'm going to start by just with Susan. We'll go the way you're seated. Um, Susan, you're a Vermonter. Mm -hmm. Your father served in Vietnam. What was his experience in the war, and how did his experience influence your decision to devote so much of your own life to trying to help people in Vietnam and Laos who have been affected by Agent Orange and other legacies of the war? Thanks, Tim, and thanks to University of Vermont for um, holding this um, meeting. I have three brothers and two nieces who attended the university. So, um, and I'm happy to be here to talk about um, my work on addressing war legacy issues and all that I want to thank, I can thank in person again, Senator Leahy and Tim for all that you've done to mitigate those issues. Um, yeah, I'm an army brat. My dad was in the Army Corps of Engineers for 20 years and he served two tours in Vietnam before I was six years old. And he never, like many children, uh, many parents of veterans, he, many veterans, they never talked to their children about their experience, very rarely. And I was, it was probably 20 years into my work in Vietnam. He's very proud of what I did, but 20 years into it, he sat down at the kitchen table and he put this piece of shrapnel, piece of metal on the table. And I thought, he said to the first time he ever told this story was that this piece of metal nearly made your mother a widow with seven children. I had no idea he had been that close to action during the Tet Offensive in Saigon. He always said, oh, my job was to make sure the generals had their ice for their martinis. <laughs> you know, but even those who were more behind the scenes, you weren't always you know, out of danger in Vietnam. Um, I went to Vietnam in 1991 in part because I wanted to see what it was about this country that had taken my father away from our family for so long and, and trying to understand why we had to send three million of our soldiers and, and over there to countries that we had no, we had not been attacked by them. I just couldn't quite grasp that as, as a young person. And why we had to have 58, 000, more than 58,000 of them not come home and why three million Cam Cambodian, Lao and Vietnamese had to die. It was not something we studied in high school, especially I was close enough to the end of the war that by the time I got to high school, we were, when I graduated, we we're still talking about World War II. You know, Vietnam was not in our high school curriculum at all. I didn't even know half my teachers were veterans of the war for that. Um, so I went back and I found a very poor country in 1991. You would see that um, there were children who were scavenging for food, um, the U.S. had had a trade embargo against Vietnam, um, a diplomatic embargo. It, it was really um, devastating for me to, to see that, that um, poverty. Um, but I also found a country with young people with such hope. I mean, the war had been over then for more than 15 years. The, the government had opened up their economy. 
Um, and there was just this hope and energy for the future that I really knew I wanted to go back somehow. Um, my background was in education, so I thought maybe I would, I would get involved in that field. Um, but I began to volunteer for the Fund for Reconciliation and Development when I was in grad school, and I got asked if I wanted to work full time for them, and so I jumped on that opportunity. And I began to do people to people exchange work. We organized conferences with NGOs who had been working in, on war legacy issues. And I became very involved over time on the issue of, of Agent Orange. Just a few photos of things. I met a lot of um, Vietnamese who had been working on this issue for so many years, trying to understand what the environmental impacts had been, the health impacts. I had met families who had, who had children with severe disabilities. And I knew, I, I was angry that at that time, in the early 2000s, the US was doing absolutely nothing to address the Agent Orange issue. They had begun to work on the unexploded ordinance issue, again, thanks to the Leahy War Victims Fund, um, and get, then eventually into landmine removal. But the Agent Orange issue was something that had, um, was causing a, uh, after the two countries normalized relations, it was causing friction because um, the US and the Vietnamese could not in the early 2000s talk about it. And in fact, I had been told, how you can let me know if this is true, that the embassy was told not to talk about the issue with people like me who had been working in Vietnam um, for so long. There was just no seeing of eye to eye on, on this issue at all, at all. And partly it was, um, because a lot of attention, when the Vietnamese victims of Agent Orange sued chemical companies in the United States um, uh, to try to get um, assistance to the people in Vietnam who had been impacted by Agent Orange, there was a lot of media attention. Um, international, it was in the New York Times, this is a Vanity Fair piece. Um, filmmakers, photographers had gone to Vietnam to document the stories of victims of the Agent Orange. And it got to the point where the embassy could no longer deny that this was, in, this was friction between them, that this was an issue that they had to find a way to address. <clears throat> and at this time, with all this media attention that was happening, um, I got a phone call one day when I was in the office in New York from Nancy Feldman, whose husband, Bob, had been a veteran. He, he served at Bin Hoa, and he was dying um, of his ex from his exposure to Agent Orange. I never got to meet Bob. But um, Bob and Nancy, before Bob died, wanted to be sure that some US funds were going to Vietnam to assist victims who were, people in Vietnam who were also impacted by Agent Orange. Um, because at this time, we had not yet achieved that um, with the US funding. And sadly, Bob died around Memorial Day of, of 2026. And Nancy donated her VA benefits um, to my organization. And dozens and dozens of Bob's friends and family, including Nancy, uh, Marjorie Lipson, who's here today, contributed in Bob's honor. And I took that money and partnered with the, the Vietnam Red Cross, and we set up a, a program to provide direct assistance to families who were suffering from the long-term generational impacts of, of Agent Orange. And we have continued that now for the last almost 20 years since Bob died. And these, it's such an inspiration to me of what one person's decision to make a difference can do. And now almost 20 years later, over half a million dollars has been donated by individual Americans, by veterans who, who are inspired by Bob's story, by his friends, by his family. And we have been able to help over 600 families who are extremely poor, who are, who are, who are caring for, for children. When I say children, sometimes we're talking about 30, 40 year old um, adult children who have, have really been um, physically and, and developmentally and um, impacted by uh, the decision to spray herbicides that had been contaminated with dioxin across um, vast areas of Vietnam and, and parts of, of Laos. And, and um, I, I'm just inspired by, um, by Nancy and Bob, who, who had that, that notion to, to think we, we, we can do something. And, and they did. And that's, um, it, it was the, begin, the largest project of my organization when I started the War Legacies Project. I decided to move back to Vermont. My boss at the time was 
he decided to focus on reconciliation with Cuba, which <laughs> still hasn't happened, but um, he, I moved back to Vermont and founded the War Legacies Projects, thanks again to um, connecting to the last uh, panel, um, to um, Nance, uh, Sally Benson and Steve Nichols, who were all part of the International Voluntary Service and met in Vietnam in 1968. And they set up a foundation many years later and funded my, my basically helped me establish um, WLP and continue to help. Um, so that here's an you know, example of people who were part of the anti-war movement who then continue to focus on, on these legacies that we're dealing with today. And I was able to bring Nancy and her daughter Sarah in 2013 to, to Vietnam. And this is um, Mrs. Swan who we met, and we met her and her husband, Mr. Va. And they, have, they had five children. A, a, their firstborn was married and, and living away from home. Their second son had severe developmental disabilities. Um, and then twin boys, oh, one, I'm sorry, one other son had died of his physical disabilities. And then two twin boys born in 1982 who are in this photo, who are bedridden. They, they um, had such severe disabilities that, and at this point stage in their life, early, there was no early inter intervention that could have possibly made a difference. But Mrs. Swan explained to us the day-to-day -day life that she had, the, you know, her daily life's um, activities. You know, she'd wake up very early, prepare the meals for the boys, it would take her a couple hours to feed them, and then it was to, then she would have to bathe them, clean up underneath this rattan bed that they're sleeping on because they were not able to move to a, a commode or something. Um, and then it was, lunch would start and do it all over again. And it was just non-consuming. And she had very little sleep because the boys had epilepsy seizures as well at night, frequent seizures. And so she was functioning just on autopilot. And as we were leaving, um, his, her husband asked us, please, please, please take your message back to your government and ask them to do something to help me and the thousands of other families like mine. And I spent, a, this is Nancy and Sarah as we, we left, um, and I, we were working, my organization works with the very rural populations who, are, who have been impacted by, by Agent Orange. But I began to, I had been working for several years at that time with many other um, NGOs and um, organizations like Vietnam Veterans of America Foundation, uh, the Fort Ch uh, Chuck Searcy at, uh, at Project Renew, Charles Bailey at the Ford Foundation. There was a small, a relatively small group of us who had been pushing this issue and trying to get the US <coughs> government to um, finally do something. And we had, there was a breakthrough, and, and you'll see a, some photos here of this as well, but the um, 1080 Committee and Committee 33, which was the Vietnamese organizations that were, their committees that were focused on researching and really documenting the long-term health and environmental impacts of Agent Orange. <clears throat> they had been working with a group called Hatfield Consultants of Canada, and they had wanted to n answer the question that was on everybody's minds at the time, like what is the long-term impacts of those dioxin herbicides, uh, impacted herbicides? Are, is the vast areas where these herbicides were sprayed still contaminated? And thankfully, through their research, they found out that it was these bases that Tim mentions where the herbicides were stored, where they were loaded onto airplanes, that that was the big problem um, when it came to dioxin contamination. And that became a manageable problem. It was defined and it was a problem that the US government, who has a lot of expertise on cleanup of brownfields, and the Vietnamese government could work closely together. And that enabled, finally in 2006, President Bush and President Triet to, to come together with this joint statement saying that we can work together on this issue and it's going to be a very important um, way for the two countries to, um, to cooperate together. And this enabled, this is a lot where, where Tim started working really hard <laughs> over the next several years and Senator Leahy to get funding into the appropriations bills to first start cleaning up these dioxin contaminated hotspots in, um, in Vietnam. But they also never forgot about 
the families who were impacted. In the language of the bill, there's always, you know, in the very first bill, um, it mentioned providing support to people um, to address health issues um, in the areas near dioxin, I forget the language, but in, to, to focus on the health impacts as well. Families like this. Um, and it was it still, even though the language is in the bill, I would just remember you know, celebrating some little success, but then hitting a wall at the State Department, I mean, yeah, the, the U.S. Embassy that just did not want to deal with the health part. I mean, they really dragged their feet on, on trying to address this. And it was Tim and it was Senator Leahy that kept pushing and pushing and fine-tuning the language to make sure that not only was it just focused on, you know, outside these, these air bases that had, were contaminated, but the problem with this transgenerational impacts that we were seeing in Vietnam, where um, family, it would, these birth defects and disabilities could go from generation to generation, and now we're in the fourth, at least fourth generation of this problem. And we, you know, I would bug Tim and Charles Bailey would bug Tim and others would say, let's you know, fine tune this to make sure that we're not just helping people regardless of their, because of their disabilities, regardless of cause, but helping people who, have, who are the ones that the Vietnamese have been fighting for for so long, those who have been impacted by Agent Orange, families like this that had four children <laughs> with severe disabilities. And the language finally, finally got there, thankfully, and it's now been, oh, I want to have to say $169 million, I believe, that has gone into programs that are now being managed by, by um, not just international NGOs, but local Vietnamese NGOs who are on the ground, who are providing these direct services to people who have been impacted um, by Agent Orange. And so once the, you know, Vietnam was, was on its way, I would then turn my eyes across the border to Laos, which I knew had already also had been heavily sprayed by Agent Orange, but we knew very little about it. I mean, the, the Vietnamese had been studying this issue since the war, but the Lao, really, the area sprayed was on the, on the Ho Chi Minh Trill area where ethnic minority groups live very remote from, from the capital in Bien Chun. And we didn't know anything about what the impacts were, so I would go. Let me interrupt you. Mm -hmm. Let's get to Laos after. Okay. Let me go to these others, and okay. then we'll come back to Laos. All right. Sounds good. Because that's a whole other story. <laughs> <laughs> Next. But that gives you a sense of what's been going on over the last 30 years. And it's actually a lot more than $167 million. It helps to have the chairman of the Appropriations Committee <laughs> um, care about something like this. It's well, about that's for the health related, not okay. the... Well, I know, yeah, but, but it's, yeah. yeah. Um, Chuck, let me ask you, as a Marine officer in the office of the Defense Attaché in Hanoi, what was your job and how did you get involved in dealing with problems resulting, I realize maybe, I don't know if you all can hear me back there, okay, um, how did you get involved in dealing with problems resulting from a war half a century ago, like MIAs and Agent Orange? What was it like working with your Vietnamese counterparts uh, on those issues, and, and what difference do you feel that you made? And thanks, Tim, I appreciate that. Uh, before I start, uh, I just wanted to offer a sincere, heartfelt uh, thank you, uh, Senator Lady. In the Marine Corps, our core values are honor, courage, and commitment. And what you've done for 50 years, you know, to, to have the moral courage to do the right thing, to, to do the right thing when it matters is uh, incredibly honorable. And Ambassador Zutin. It was from, 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 from an embassy and a Marine Corps perspective, it was my honor to work to implement a lot of the things you would have fought so hard for. And I really mean that. Ambassador Zutin, just an incredibly effective bridge between our two countries over the years. And the family members, uh, every career Marine knows that, that the family that stands beside people who are doing this work. Uh, University of Vermont, thank you for hosting this event today and for the entire community of interest. Uh, and really I'm kind of looking in the back too at the, the younger demographic and the students. This is important. It's important to understand history and where we've been and how we got there. 
but it's important to understand the lessons that can be learned so that hopefully we make a better generation for, for the world moving forward, right? That's, that's what this is all about. And that's what my work in Vietnam was all about, Tim. So to de demystify the term defense attache, that, that sounds like something super, super high speed. It's, it's really not. Uh, what you're trying to do is you're trying to understand what your country's priorities are, you know, your, your US government policies, uh, national interests, you know, Department of Defense, Marine Corps, those kinds of interests. And if you're any good, uh, we could debate my performance, but if you're any good, what you're also trying to do is understand the country you're working with, what's important to them, what their interests are, you know, where they're trying to go. And then what you try to do is you try to overlap it. You try to find ways that you can uh, work together to advance that, right? So when I first started my job, I didn't get that memo. Uh, like a lot of Marines, I think you go in, you're just ready for action. So my mindset in 2017 was, uh, I'm going to advance the Marine Corps relationship. We're going we're gonna to take this to new heights. I realized really quickly that uh, that's sensitive in Vietnam. Direct mill-mill cooperation is sensitive. And also just the foundation wasn't quite here, there yet. So I hit some walls and uh, started asking, but why? Uh, quite a bit. And what I started finding was, it, it didn't take me long at all to find, is we were actually incredibly strategically aligned with Vietnam. What kind of world we want to live in, you know, a world where might doesn't make right, a world where we respect international law, those types of things. We were actually very aligned there. So that part became easy. Um, even with military and military cooperation, there's a lot we could explore. Peacekeeping, cooperation, you know, humanitarian assistance, kind of those types of things. There's a lot there. What was needed was trust, probably more than anything, just, just to really build trust. And the key to that trust was going to be legacy of war cooperation, humanitarian legacy of war cooperation. And I could relate to some of this. Uh, you know, when I reflect back on, on kind of my life, uh, I grew up the, the son of a Marine. Uh, my, my brother's there behind me to fact check me, Matt. Matt's, Matt's the team physician for uh, the university here. I'm really proud of him. Uh, we grew up with a, a PTSD dad in the house, you know, a, a father who was proud of his Marine Corps service, uh, like Rusty, had, you know, as a helicopter guy, so he had flown into these incredibly dangerous situations every day of his life and seen the worst that humanity has to offer, and he, he, he dealt with that, and we grew up in that environment, which was tough sometimes. And at the same time, he never said anything bad about, about Vietnam. In 50 years, he hasn't. He, he left Vietnam with this profound respect for the culture and the beauty. When you're flying over 300 feet for, for 26 months, you know, he just, just saw the beauty of it personally, uh, and that made a big mark on me. Uh, but what also made a mark on me is just how, how, how raw this human emotion is in these, in these issues, right? Matt, I don't know if you remember, but, but kind of tying into why I got involved in the legacy of war work, in addition to Vietnam telling us it was important, I could relate to it because I could understand the pain and the guilt. Um, David, like some of you talked about that a little bit last night, just some of these veterans carry for, for the rest of their lives. And in high school, we had a veteran, uh, one of my dad's cult friends come stay with us for a couple nights. Dad warned us that, hey, he takes you know, a lot of medicine and has a lot of bad dreams, uh, and he did. And as kids, we didn't really understand this. But what I did understand is he didn't make it. A year or two later, uh, he took his own life. 30 years after those experiences, it was just still that raw and that deep, right? What I also saw was a few years later, uh, when my father finally came to Vietnam, I was, excuse me, I was there and bought dad a ticket, and I didn't think he would come to Vietnam, uh, but he did. And what I saw, he came, and a lot of people come back to Vietnam, they want to sit in the same foxhole they sat in, and that's, that's, that doesn't always go the way they plan because things change and it's hard to find that. All dad wanted to do was find the orphanage that they used to, uh, frankly, pilfer supplies off base and go and give to the nuns mm -hmm. in a brief respite of, of humanitarianism during the war. And so we found it over in Da Nang, and this nun comes down. It took him a little, few minutes to understand who each other were, but all of a sudden she goes, I still sleep on the bed that you brought 50 years ago. You know, if it wasn't for that humanitarian spirit, we would have had nothing. And he's crying, I'm crying, my poor wife's trying to translate all this, but I watched 50 years of, of pain and guilt and all these feelings you're trying to keep inside and deal with just, just dissipate. And not that, not that he was healed after that, but, but very, very different. The next day, to kind of wrap this up, the next day we went up to Quang Chi, up on the DMZ, who I think uh, my colleagues will talk a little bit, but, but Quang Chi is one of the most heavily contaminated provinces in the world for bombs. Uh, they, they live with this threat daily. If any, and my dad used to fly missions over there. And so if any part of Earth would have a place to, to hate my dad and me, it would be Quang Chi. And they didn't. He went up there as a veteran, and it was hugs. I literally watched, did this cut off? You want me to pause? <laughs> That's okay. I think we're back now. So 
They didn't. What, what I saw was, was, was hug. I mean, former combatants, seeing my dad, like the story of General Vin, Senator, you know, former combatants who just had a profound respect for each other on a human level, uh, who answered their nation's call, did the best they could, and just embraced each other as human beings. So the power of all that really came with me when I got that assignment in Vietnam in 2017. And I knew that we were strategically aligned, and I knew that legacy of war cooperation had to be a part of it. And I started seeing that, you know, we're all kind of thinking the same things here, but there's these hurdles, right? Um, so I made it my mission. Marines, sometimes we do that. When I wasn't doing direct Marine Corps to Marine Corps cooperation, I realized we're gonna advance the relationship here. And so I, that's what I did. I, I really focused on, on two things, like Tim said, uh, the Paul Mill relationship, the political military relationship, just what are strategic interests and how can we work towards that moving the future? Uh, but probably half of my effort over there was on the, the legacy of war humanitarian portfolio, just finding ways to get over these roadblocks, finding ways to understand kind of the, the priorities and limits of both sides, how to overcome the bureaucratic challenges, which are massive on our side and the Vietnamese side, uh, the fiscal challenges, the legal challenges, all those kinds of things. And at the end of the day, I think my lesson learned, and again, Senator Leahy, I really took this from your playbook, is uh, probably two things, and this is probably the lesson for the people in you know, the next generation in the back of the room, is first of all, all it takes for bad things to happen in the world is for good people to do nothing. That's, that's not my quote, that's, I think that might have been a Reagan quote, right? And it's absolutely true. I could have gone and done my job and just you know, reported on what's happening in Vietnam and sent that back to DC, and, and that, I, that would have been a successful attache job. But I realized there was something really important here. It was important to get this relationship right. It was strategically important, especially as now as we're seeing. And it was just the right thing to do, right? So that was the first thing. And the second part of that is just individuals can make a difference, right? So I just leaned in. And when I give an example of that, Andrew will talk about the you know, big program he's working on, but being on the team in, in the embassy and just having that foundation, again, kind of where I came from, asking but why a million times to all of my colleagues, to defense colleagues, foreign affairs colleagues, the party, the veterans, people on the street. Uh, and with armed with that knowledge, uh, at that point, just being unrelentless. I mean, Tim, you remember when we cold called you out of the blue, just, I'm Chuck Casey, you've never heard of me. This is important to Vietnam. How can we make this happen? And we were, just as a team, we were able to create new authorities, create new funding lines to address some of the programs that are you know, the most important to the Vietnamese side. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and pause there. I could obviously talk all day. I think we all could. Um, but I'm happy to kind of answer more questions about any of that after panel or over lunch, so. Well, I think you can tell that it would be hard to envision a better, more thoughtful partner than, than Chuck uh, in, the, in the US military uh, to work on these things. Sarah, the US war in Vietnam also had lasting impacts on the people of neighboring Laos. The US secretly bombed Laos, where provinces along the Vietnam border today, 50 years later, are still littered with millions and millions of US cluster munitions, which can be triggered by anyone who comes into contact with them. Describe what happened during the war and how it has affected the people of Laos since then. And what are your organization and others, including the US government, doing to help the people who have been affected there? Thanks, Tim. Um, hi, everyone. How are we all feeling so far? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's, a, it's been quite a long day, um, but really powerful. And I echo all of my colleagues' thanks to University of Vermont and, of course, Senator Leahy and Tim. Um, thanks for always picking up my calls. Um, so what I'll uh, share today is just um, a personal story of my family's journey um, and then the work of Legacies of War, um, an organization that's founded by a Lao American 20 years ago. Um, and, you know, and, and ways that you all can make a difference. I really appreciate what Chuck said that, you know, individuals can truly make a difference. So I grew up in southern Laos. Um, anybody been to Laos besides the panel? Okay. <laughs> All right, great. A couple hands. Awesome. So this is uh, southern Laos where I grew up. It's Jampasak province. So it's home to the magnificent Wat Pu or mountain temple as translated. Um, you know, it's a lesser known cousin of the iconic Angkor Wat um, of Cambodia, which um, I'm sure most people have heard about. So as a child, uh, my grandmother used to take me there and my siblings, and we run around 
and chase the goats and the notorious cats. Um, and that was my favorite thing to do until my grandmother would call all of us to run up the steep hill. The photo does not do it justice. So back then, I used to run. I don't know how. Today, I crawl. Um, but when we get all the way up to the mountain temple, the Wat Pu, my grandmother would drench us with holy water. So you all know I'm extra blessed. Um, and then grandma would lead us in a prayer. Um, and the prayer would be for my parents. So my father, uh, Dr. Suicide Gu and um, my father was a surgeon who, uh, and my mother, uh, she'll be in the next slide, um, he was a surgeon and she was a renowned seamstress. I'm actually wearing her sin here. Um, they traveled all over Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam, working on victims of UXO accidents or unexploded ordnance. Um, and my mother would alter clothing for children and families who have lost limbs. So here we are. Um, so the picture up there, that's my mother, my beautiful mother. And I'm the cutest kid up there, obviously <laughs> the one in red. Um, you know, so, so we would do that. And you know, I, um, most of my childhood, the presence of UXO was very prominent. You know, it touched every aspect of our lives. And, when I started going to school at the age of five, uh, we were taught to only walk on well-worn paths in order to avoid harm. And for the most part, I thought my neighborhood was pretty safe. Until one day, right after coming home from school, um, we heard loud banging, knocking on our door, villagers were calling for my father to come out. And my father rushed out and I followed him um, to just our front door. And what I witnessed that day still haunts me, you know, over 30 years later. Dare laying there um, and screaming was my classmate La. And her mother was just pleading with my father um, to save her daughter's life. My dad was forced to amputate La's leg in order to save her life. This happened in 1989. She was born decades after the last bombs were dropped. And the following years, um, my parents made the very difficult decision to uproot our family, and we fled to the United States in 1990. That's a picture of me right there holding um, a sticky rice pail, a uh, sticky rice steamer, um, as I was stepping off the plane. We landed in Washington, D.C., and my aunts an uncle who fled during the war, who now live in the United States, um, picked us up. We drove past monuments, huge monuments, the White House, the Pentagon. You know, I was awestruck um, at my new home. I, I basically just fell in love with this magnificent country. But I had zero clue of the US's connection to Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam. So from 1960s and 70s, the US dropped at least 13 million tons of ordnance on these three countries combined. Today, um, at least 200 people, um, there has been at least 200 casualty from these unexploded bombs, or UXO. 200,000. Yeah, at least 200,000, yes. So in Laos alone, um, from 1964 to 1973, the U.S. dropped at least 2.5 million tons of ordnance. That's during 580,000 bombing mission. To give you some perspective, that's a plane load of bombs every eight minutes, 24 hours a day for nine straight years. It earned Laos the most bomb country per capita in the history of the world. The population of Laos during that time was barely 2.2 million people. So that's like having 2,000 pounds of bomb for every child, woman, and man. Roughly 25% of the population of Laos during that time had to flee, including members of my family. So,
why does it matter today? Um, you know, it matters today because between 10 to 30% of the bombs did not explode in Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam. So in Laos, you know, Tim already mentioned millions. You know, to give you a uh, rough estimate, it's roughly 80 million UXO still litter the land, laying there, waiting for a six-year-old child to trigger it or an animal. So, you know, what we do at Legacies of War is we work, um, oh, sorry, uh, here's another, another map that, um, you know, to also help you understand what 30% look like. The amount of bombs that are still littering the country of Laos, if you take all those bombs, it can cover Vermont at least like three point, almost five percent, five times more. So three and a half times. Um, you know, imagine what life would be like for the children and family of Vermont if Vermont had to experience this. So, you know, huge, huge thanks to the leadership um, and the ringleader of Senator Patrick Leahy. Um, you know, and, and Tim Reeser for working so hard to ensure that, you know, the U.S. take leadership and responsibility for the cleanup of unexploded ordnance in Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam. Most people know legacies of war when, um, you know, U.S. President, the first U.S. President, um, sitting U.S. President uh, Barack Obama went to Laos and announced historical funding um, for UXO clearance. And he actually mentioned our founder during his speech. So, you know, that didn't just happen overnight. It happened because thousands of Americans from all across the U.S. helped us write letters to members of Congress saying this is an important issue that we care about. We want the United States to do more. So today, you know, my team and I um, are very, very proud, um, you know, of the support that we've been able to earn from members of Congress. Um, through our 20 years of advocacy effort, pushing for greater funding. And, you know, we truly do credit so much of our success to Senator Leahy, because when he says something, others follow. So, you know, we're, um, we have big plans for you later. <laughs> so, um, you know, I'm very proud, as an American, um, I'm proud of the U.S.'s support. The U.S. has invested at least $5 billion since 1993 in over 100 countries all around the world that are impacted by UXO. Um, this year, you know, my team and I are working really, really hard in order to push Congress for um, greater funding to help support this pot. Um, so $290 million to be allocated to uh, countries all over the world, not just Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam, but we ask that 80 million of that goes to fund work in Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam. So in addition to pushing for greater funding, we also push for um, greater members of the House to join the UXO and Demining Caucus to ensure that leadership remains strong um, and continue to champ that members of Congress continue to champion the support for funding efforts. And lastly, like I said, Senator Leahy, um, uh, you're not done yet. <laughs> so this is my way of just shining the bat light um, uh, because we, we need continued support um, in order to resolve this issue. And so I'll just leave with um, three, three asks to wrap, to wrap it up, um, uh, Tim. So our pillars at Legacies of War is history, healing, and hope. And you know, for me, as a Lao American who um, personally lived in contaminated land as, as a child, I really, really believe that we need to learn from our own history. And this is part of American history. It is not just a history of the people of Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam. So we have to learn from our history in order to do our very, very best to make better policies. Like, we know that munitions like cluster bombs, anti-personnel landmines are indiscriminate. They don't have an expiration date. They will continue to kill until we find them and destroy them first. So the U.S. should be a leader in banning these weapons and in learning from the mistakes of the past um, to avoid bar bombing civilian targets. Because in a country like Laos, you know, I talked to you about the 2.5 million tons of bombs that were dropped. 
a staggering 98% of the victims were civilian targets, like my ancestors. The second piece is we cannot fully heal from the past if the legacies of war are not resolved. So you heard you know, veterans speak earlier. You heard so many activists speak earlier. But this is a 50-year-old, over 50-year-old legacies. And we still have records that have yet to be released. So Senator Leahy, we need your help in getting those released. <laughs> um, <laughs> Since ten, Senator Welch is not here, um, <laughs> you know, Chuck spoke a little bit about MIAs, right? So in my work, I speak to numerous veterans and their family. My board chair um, is an 84-year young U.S. Air Force pilot who still has friends that are missing in action, and their families are waiting for them to be brought home. So we need to resolve that um, before healing can fully begin. Last is hope. You know, I believe that Americans care about this issue, and we need to amplify it. So I'm extremely grateful for the University of Vermont for giving us this platform to speak about this and elevating this issue. We need more people to follow suit to do that. Um, and Legacies of War, you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention to our young folks, um, we do have a robust internship program, and we champion a lot of Mine Action Fellows who want to help make a difference. Um, so I'll leave it at that, Tim. Thank Great. you. Thank you. Andrew, hard act to follow. Mm -hmm. Since the 1980s, the government of Vietnam has helped the U.S. Department of Defense locate the remains of hundreds of American MIAs. Talk about the Vietnam Wartime Accounting Initiative. How and when did it begin? Who's involved? What are its goals? And what is the United States Institute of Peace's role? What progress do you feel that we've made so far? Thanks a lot, Tim. It's, it's really an honor to be here uh, with Senator Leahy, with you, Ambassador Zum, and, and the University of, of Vermont, uh, because USIP's program on Vietnam came about in, in large part through your, your encouragement and efforts. Uh, USIP started 40 years ago. We were founded by Congress as a public institute uh, that's nonpartisan, working to prevent, resolve, and mitigate violent conflicts around the world. Uh, we were founded by veterans in, in Congress, people who had served in World War II, Korea, and Vietnam, and believed that the US needed a peace building uh, capacity alongside our military capabilities. Uh, one of the work that we've done in Vietnam is uh, relating to uh, helping Vietnam search for and identify their missing from the war, uh, which are actually larger than America's by a factor of at least 100 times. Uh, earlier this year, I had the chance to accompany a group of US veterans and also families of US MIAs to Vietnam. And we visited battle sites. We met with families uh, of Vietnamese missing. And as they shared their stories with each other, it was immediately clear that these are the same stories of loss and healing and spending decades looking for answers. Uh, some of them have found answers through the work of uh, US Defense Department through the Vietnamese government's agencies, but there's a lot more that, that needs to be done. Uh, so USIP's role uh, in what's called the Vietnam Wartime Accounting Initiative um, set up in 2021 is to support veterans exchange communications, uh, public education about uh, US-Vietnam relations uh, and peace. And we work together uh, with, uh, I'll skip to this picture, uh, with both Vietnamese and US in international partners. Um, that includes Harvard University doing archival research. It includes the International Commission on Missing Persons in the Netherlands. Uh, 
on the right, several of the U.S. veterans that we've worked with who are looking for mass graves uh, of North Vietnamese and Viet Cong from uh, sites in southern and central Vietnam are working together with Vietnamese researchers uh, to identify sites based on aerial <coughs> photographs and witness information. Uh, this is really uh, time sensitive because it's a long time. Uh, things have changed in Vietnam. Witnesses are dwindling and their memories need to be confirmed uh, really in the next few years. So this is something that we're really working to uh, uh, add to, especially coming up to next year, being the 50th anniversary of the end of the war and 30th anniversary of US-Vietnam normal relations. Um, this is an example of how an issue that used to be a really big obstacle between our countries uh, has become the basis for trust and cooperation, as, as Chuck was saying. Uh, you, know, you may remember in the 1980s, even in the 90s, uh, the MIA issue was linked with prisoners of war uh, and became a, a reason for the US and Vietnam not to have normal relations. Um, it's now coming up on 40 years since the US and Vietnam have been cooperating. Really, Vietnam has been helping the US to, to uh, search for our missing. And this program brings it you know, around in a full circle, really. Uh, it's the last of the major war legacy issues now that we are cooperating on. Um, and it affects so many families in Vietnam, uh, some of whom had people fighting on both sides of the war. Uh, and to be able to provide information, maybe the physical remains, maybe not at this point, but at least an accounting, that uh, information leading to an understanding of, of where their, their relatives uh, are buried and what happened to them. U.S. veterans have helped in this a great deal because they have information about uh, battles, mass graves. Uh, they have artifacts in some cases that they brought back with them from Vietnam uh, that in some cases we collectively have been able to find the Vietnamese family that that belongs to or comes from um, and return those artifacts. That's also gone the other way. There are Vietnamese families that have artifacts from, from the US and we've helped to return a few of those. So that's really meaningful work and I think it, uh, yeah, it, it complements the stories of Asian Orange and UXO, which are also physical legacies that have affected people in both countries as a way that can really bring us together. For USIP, I mean, we're, we're looking for positive stories to tell about peace building in the 21st century. Uh, this is one that we can point to where former enemies have come together to work on um, our future. And somehow the legacies of this war have become a way to do that. Uh, and again, r really want to commend Senator Leahy and your colleagues uh, in, in both parties in Congress who have supported this over the years. Thank you. David, David, remind me what our time is, because I, uh, I can't remember. Thank you, sir. Okay. Um, I just want to go back to Chuck for one minute, because I think it's worth saying just another word about, you know, how you would describe relations between the U.S. military and the Vietnamese military today, two former enemies. But how, how have you seen the change, and, and um, you know, what, what importance do you give to it? Uh, th thanks, Tim. So probably the easiest visual manifestation of, of where we're at now is the fact that we've had three aircraft carrier visits come to Vietnam in the last seven years. I remember working the first one in 2018, proposing that idea, proposing that Vietnam allow a U.S. aircraft carrier visit to come into Da Nang. Uh, I'll be very blunt with this language. I called my predecessor who was you know, in Vietnam in 2015 and his exact comment was, uh, are you smoking crack? Like the idea, I mean, I mean it, was, it was that far of a departure from what could even be possible in 2015 to what we did in early 2018. And then we did it two more times, right? 
So, so that, that right there is probably the biggest visual representation of, of kind of where we're at, Tim. Now it's nuanced. Again, I talked before about wanting to see more Marine Corps and Marine Corps cooperation. Uh, things are still just sensitive. This is a tough neighborhood Vietnam lives in. Uh, they, they have uh, neighbors that they need to, to delicately manage relations with. Um, so I, I personally believe, I, I absolutely agree with uh, my former boss's title of his book, Nothing in Boss, Nothing is Impossible, Ambassador Ted Osius, another champion of legacy of war cooperation. I personally believe nothing is impossible, even in the defense space, but it's how you do it. It's, it's really asking, but why? You know, hey, here's what we'd like to do. Okay, here's what we'd like to do. But why? You know, what's important? How can we get there? And kind of finding that way, Tim. Um, so I, I'd say that context. I'd also be happy to talk with Tim if we have another minute, just, just in general, what that ties into about the farther bilateral relationship and just how that affects kind of everyone. Is that so, so a lot of people may not know either. A lot of times we, we as Team America, uh, especially this community of interest, we tend to look at things through a security lens, right? This, that tends to be how we, we, we see the world as Americans. Uh, Asia sees things through an economic lens. And what we've been able to do is build an economic partnership that's bringing incredible prosperity to both sides. So a lot of people aren't aware, but right now Vietnam is our eighth largest trading partner in the US, our eighth largest partner, $130 billion trade relationship and we're their biggest export market. So it's an incredibly strong, robust economic relationship now that, that, that's in every single sector, I mean, health and life sciences and clean energy and uh, increasingly uh, info communication technologies. Your party secretary was here last week and massive pledges from the private sector in, you know, Google, $2 billion investment in Vietnam's workforce a couple months ago. Microsoft, same thing, I mean, massive investments. This is where the relationship is now and it benefits every state, every sector, and really most people in the United States, that's where the relationship is at now and where it's going. But to come back full circle, Tim, to, to, to what you asked about why, you know, but why, um, it's trust. It, it's, it was very purposeful, purposeful investments in trust by, by understanding what was important to both sides. And at the end of the day, a realization that just like, like dad said, Matt, you know, 50 years ago, just we have so much more in common than we ever had different. How we see the world, what, what we want the world to look like for our kids, uh, how we want to raise our kids, you know, very, very similar. And so, and, and we, we, we want to get rid of legacy of war challenges, give a, give a safe world to our kid and find our ancestors. We share those kinds of things. So really prioritizing that cooperation, uh, building trust him. Um, and actually, if I can tell one more vignette about General Vin behind me, because Senator Lee, I think you'll appreciate this story. You may not have heard this. I, I saw General Vin cry. I, I saw a Vietnamese general cry. So the story of General Vinh, General Vinh was the son of famed General uh, Nguyen Chi Thanh from Vietnam. His father was a wartime general, a very, very revered, very competent uh, general during the war with America. And General Vinh, uh, General Vinh's father died when he was six or seven years old, very, very young. So General Vinh uh, grows up, uh, ends up going to the Ministry of National Defense, you know, against the backdrop of his father being a wartime hero fighting against the Americans went to the intelligence community as his father had. Uh, and so that's what he did the first 20, 30 years in his career until 2010. So in 2010, he's, he becomes a three-star general uh, in their system, uh, gets put in charge of Vietnam's international defense relations. So he's coming with that, with that background, just maybe someone who, someone who's always very practical, but probably wasn't the most pro-US person in the room in 2010, based against that background. But he was a champion. He was the one that just continued to message to us that, hey, the key to doing more is legacy of war cooperation. The reason why is we're a country that reveres our elders, reveres our, our, our war heroes, uh, and they're a massive domestic constituents, just like in your, in your system. If you wanna, frankly, get their vote, you need to, to do this. So we did more. There's a very famous picture of him holding uh, Ambassador Osi's hands. They're, they're, they're scooping decontaminated dirt at, at dioxin. Very famous picture. And by the end of his tenure, General Vin, again, not, not, that, not that anyone was pro any other country, just, but, but much more willing to lean towards relations with the United States towards the end of his career. I'd say probably one of the leading advocates for it. And when uh, my other former boss, Ambassador Crittenbrink, who's now Deputy or Assistant Secretary of State for, for the Pacific, when he was leaving, he had an out call with General Vin in 2020, 2021. And we're, I'll never forget the power of this, uh, but we're sitting in a room like this and General Vin reaches into his pocket and he has the coin from his father, his father's coin that he carried. And again, his father passed away when General Vin was six years old fighting the Americans. And he gives it to Ambassador Crittenbrink, just in the spirit of how, how much all this work, the trust him that's been generated, how much it matters, mm -hmm. and how it just remains this foundation of everything we're doing now, incredibly powerful. And I don't know, I'm a baby, I cry anyway, but, but, but I'm, you know, they're crying, I'm crying, you know, the poor translator is trying to bumble through this, but incredibly powerful. And Tim, back to your question before, just 
that's the why. That's the but why. It's, 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 it's the people. Just really investing in these people relationships uh, has given us incredible foundation to just do more. And just unfortunately, I'll close this by. Unfortunately, General Vin, after he retired a couple of years ago, uh, looked like he was going to go to the Veterans Association, do more good work from that capacity, and unfortunately passed away from cancer a little bit too early. Um, but Tim, it's the relationships and the trust. It's well, as Senator Leahy can say, we, we could not have had a better partner in general. And here he is standing with Senator Leahy in front of this massive concrete uh, oven, basically, mm -hmm. that was constructed by the United States to destroy the dioxin from the Da Nang airport, which had contaminated the airport and also threatened the health of thousands and thousands of people living in that vicinity. And so Senator Leahy, it ultimately took $110 million to clean up the airport, and this was part of it. Uh, and now that airport is a commercial airport. Uh, Air Force One landed there. Um, and we're still working on the Bien Hoa Air Base. Uh, that's a bigger challenge. It's going to cost about $450 million. Uh, but that will be then the completion of our uh, cooperation with Vietnam in finally cleaning up uh, the contamination from dioxin from Agent Orange. Um, I don't know. Maybe can, we have can a. I just, I just want to add one thing when you talked about the ship stocking in, in Da Nang. I think one of the other symbols of how far we've come in this relationship is um, sailors on that ship went to the Vietnam Association of Victims of Agent right. Orange Center for children with severe disabilities. I think the ban performed right. for them. I mean, when I started working on this issue so long mm -hmm. ago, as I said, the U.S. government would not talk about it. And here, our military was going back and connecting with the generations who had been That's impacted. Right. That was really incredible. And back to those comments before the next generation about the why, this is the power of individuals. We just did it. It was the right thing to do. Yeah. So we put it on an itinerary and you're willing to take a little bit of risk. And you're absolutely right, Susan. Those pictures are used over and over and over again to highlight the strength mm -hmm. of our relationship. Yeah. 100%. And in the same category of things that wouldn't have been thought possible earlier, uh, USIP is working with the War Remnants Museum in Ho Chi Minh City on a new exhibit about U.S. Vietnam cooperation on Agent Orange and UXO that's scheduled to open next year around the time of the anniversaries. The uh, War Remnants Museum was, is essentially a museum of American war crimes in Vietnam. And Senator Leahy felt, you know, there's more to the story than that. Mm -hmm. Let's also show people what we've been doing since the war to try to deal with the legacies of the war. Mm -hmm. And USIP has been critical in that. Now we've probably run out of time, but <laughs> if, if there are any questions, um, we'll just try to squeeze them in, but. Maybe one? One, sure. Two? <laughs> Maybe not. I mean, everyone's waiting for lunch, so. You know. <laughs> Thanks, probably very somewhat quickly. Um, for a long time, the. Uh, MIA POW issue was a pretty hot issue. It wasn't really until the Clinton administration that right. anything was resolved. I still see these black American black uh, flags out in front of our post offices. Mm -hmm. uh, what what is the status of the the um, MIA POW uh, situation in Vietnam? Are we still finding remains? Are there yes. numbers that are involved? Are there anecdotes that are relevant? Yeah, yeah, I mean, Chuck, yeah. you, yeah, I'm, you, I'm you may know this they, best, but yeah. Oh, Andrew, if you want to start, go ahead. Uh, yeah, so there are still three or four missions each year, joint missions between the U.S. and Vietnam. And uh, I believe four Americans have been accounted for already this year. Um, so there have been repatriation ceremonies. And um, this even continued during COVID when American uh, teams could not go to Vietnam. Uh, the Vietnamese continued this unilaterally and found several remains. Uh, the organization, the League of POW MIA Families, that was the main uh, lobby for this issue, dating back to during the war, right, uh, still exists. Um, I was recently at Arlington Cemetery and uh, happened to pass by the grave of uh, 
the brother of Anne Mills Griffiths, who's the, uh, the founder of the League, uh, who was missing in Vietnam and uh, his remains were recovered in 2018. Uh, in terms of numbers, there were almost 2,000 American missing at the end of the war. Uh, and something close to half of those have been recovered. Uh, so there's still progress on it. There's, there's some that will never be recovered, but there also are some uh, cases where the Defense Department thought that they couldn't be recovered, but now with new technology, like underwater search <coughs> capacity and so on, it might be possible. So that work continues. Uh, the Defense POW MAA Accounting Agency that Chuck used to work at yeah. uh, does this work around the world uh, for all US uh, wars since World War II. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. Can I just add to that? You know, in addition to Vietnam, there are miss, missing in action you know, uh, servicemen in Laos and Cambodia as well. And given that the UN, United States was not at war with Laos, Laos was a neutral country, many of the information in order to find you know, those missing in action are probably still classified, So, which is why we're pushing very hard for that, as well as in Cambodia. So it's very hard. But there's some 300 plus um, that's still missing in Laos. And next year, um, DPAA will celebrate 40 years of co cooperation with Laos. Perhaps this could be a sign of goodwill if we were to step up and you know, declassify some of those information to bring Americans home. I'd also just to Andrew made that comment about during COVID, the missions. I, I was working at Hawaii at that time, and no planes of any type, no commercial planes, no countries planes were coming into Hanoi during COVID. It was just a very dangerous time. The only planes that came in uh, during the time were our C-17s, bringing a team of American in you know, every quarter to do missions, uh, just like they have for the last 30, 40 years. And Andrew's right, before that, there was, there was a window of one quarter where we couldn't bring a team just at the initial outset. In Vietnam intent and not letting the mission slide, just intent on keeping that narrative that every quarter in the humanitarian spirit we have, you know, a team coming into the missions, they did. Uh, two other vignettes on that are just how hard the mission is. You're, you're, I mean, beyond needle in the haystack. There was one side up in Quang Bin, up by the DMZ, that you're excavating a rice paddy. This was the fourth time we had done it. You know, high-speed aircraft from my old squadron, VMFA 533 in the Marine Corps. You know, A6 had gone down at a very high speed. And every season, two or three times a year, the locals turn over every inch of that rice paddy to farm. I mean, impossible mission. Uh, and by the way, in Vietnam's economic development, they had built a massive high voltage power line in the middle of that field, digging down 30 feet. So absolutely impossible. However, uh, they found something. Nowadays, like Andrew was saying, advances in DNA, a bone sample the size of a fingernail can make an identification. And so it turns out they, that that was found and he's actually being interred in Arlington Cemetery on Monday, this coming Monday. Mm -hmm. But the final part of this, again, Tim, back to the why and the relationship and the trust is, when we go on these missions, our colleagues from Hanoi, uh, MFA would have to go out there and grease the skids first and, and develop enough trust with the locals to allow them to raise the idea of a team of Americans to come before we could even propose the idea. Because the last time a lot of these villages saw an American was frankly, when the people they were looking for was there to, to, to kill them. That, that's very, very true. But what we found is, for 45 days, when you have just average Americans, the people that go on these missions, there tend to be a lot of your junior enlisted people, they're just forming a bucket line. So for 45 days, you dig, you pull, pull in the bucket, and we pass it all down the line. It's incredibly monotonous. But when you do that with a villager for 45 days, back to the idea of tears, Tim, I mean, when that team leaves, I see it every single time, just these teams leave crying, the village leaves crying, and that village is left with a new vision of what Americans are really like. So again, when Hanoi comes down with the decision, do we tilt towards Washington a little bit more? That makes more people willing to raise that voice. And it's, again, it's just relationships and trust. Just a, a note, there is um, a widow of a MIA who lives in, I think she's in Westminster, Saxon's River, Vermont. Um, I went to high school with her son and he went over just before COVID. Um, he, he was missing in Laos and went over to the site. And, and a lot of um, children who've lost their their fathers in these um, accidents have gone back um, to um, to try to like I try to do kind of come to terms with why, but why why the war? They're trying to come to terms with why did I have to lose my father? Um, and so it's very important this mission, even almost well more than 50 years later now, to bring them home. I think that's it. <laughs>